So Peter should join here in just a moment. Hey, Jason. Hey. How are you, man? Not too bad. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. I was uh, was in another room and I was like, this internet was really being choppy, so I had to make a last minute location switch. Well, I, I appreciate your production challenges. Yes, <laughs> yes. We've got some very strong bandwidth now. I think I've, I've said that correctly. <laughs> This is the uh, this is the thing I find about this situation we're in is that like uh, uh, tech support is sort of the first line of 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 our of every meeting now. Yes, there's like <laughs> yes. the first the first ten minutes is just talking about how we're talking. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And can you hear me yet? Yes, I have about, you now. now. Do you have? Do you see me? <laughs> um, well, great to great to to see you. This is uh, uh, wonderful to do, and we're excited to to talk to you about uh, about your talk from 2017. And yeah. And, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. So if I look distracted, that'll be why. But um, I'll, I'll take in... your word for it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, but I think the first question that I'll ask, and then while uh, while you're answering, I'll, I'll look at the chat. Is um, uh, so from from uh, 2017 to now, uh, have you has there been any further reflection on I think where you kind of came to in that in what you talked about, like? Uh, the things you mentioned about critical thinking, um, uh, like, you know, say like a, a sort of a deeper or more like a Im embodied search for truth. Yeah. Um, uh, that kind of thing. I just, if there's been any development since then, you know, it seems like we've, you know, we've been on this kind of trajectory for a while now where it feels as though it is becoming harder and harder to distinguish fact from fiction. And you think about jump forward to right now, uh, and the imperative need for people to get some true information as something uh, as real and tangible as coronavirus, and even how challenging that is, because trying to trying to figure out, um, you know, the if there's an agenda behind what news is being reported or not, or how it might have some bearing and effect on uh, business or you know whatever whatever you want that. Um, now is a very important time for people to be able to determine what is true. It, it impacts our own safety. It impacts our our health, our families, our work, our all of it. So I, I do I do feel like you know we've been on this path where uh, trying to figure out if something is simply being sensationalized to get eyes on it, uh, or if something is a, a piece of truth. I think it's very important right now. I think we've been on this for uh, on this road for a while. So it's. Uh, now more than ever, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like what kind of what what got me thinking after watching your video was was how there is the there there the, there's the fake news that is um, uh, that that has like a, a say a specific intent that is that we may disagree with and is factually false, but uh, but is coming from an intent that isn't itself malicious yeah if that makes sense like, sure like I, i'm looking at a lot of like say climate deni denying blogs or climate change den denying blogs where like if anything it's it's almost incredibly earnest like they actually they deeply want what their position is to be true you know? right for sure um, and then versus something more malicious where there's like a, a desire to make it look truthy kind of like what what uh what you talked about with your um like using all the trappings of truth right yeah, you know, yeah, um, that it's kind of I, I guess I guess it's interesting, obviously, how I stumbled into meeting up and, and doing a TEDx talk in Calgary and my hometown. So, you know, uh, but uh, uh, was obviously coming at it from the perspective of a comedian and, and our original notion of putting together. This is that a satirical show that ran in Canada for a long time on CBC. Um, was really kind of like a loving uh, impersonation of the tone of public radio. And, and for us as kind of sketch comedians, as character uh, actors, uh, comedic voices, we just thought this is a really fun backdrop for us to play around with character. Never really thinking for a second that somebody might take what we were doing as truth. You know, for us, it was like, oh, could you imagine uh, playing a really... Uh, blowhardish, ridiculous character uh, talking about something outlandish and outrageous, but serving it up in a very recognizable, dry way. And for us, mm. we thought that was really funny. And we kind of thought, you know, we like that it's not going to be uh, a, a laugh track or, or 
trying to push obviously that this is comedy like we kind of like that for people to discover on their own I, I guess that's the kind of comedy that i enjoy as well and so mm -hmm. it, we stumbled into this notion very very quickly that people were really taking what we were saying though our intention was satirical comedic people were taking it as truth and and really getting pretty charged about it and so mm -hmm. it it kind of illuminated a few things for us which is that you know sometimes it's less about the content and more about what surrounds the content it's more about how it's served to us how it's brought up to us uh, that a grabby catchy headline that goes across our you know feed on social media or whatever sometimes we don't even do much further uh, digging on that because it's basically like it's become this little sound bite a culture we have so much information streaming at us that we can't read everything that comes our way and so you're looking at these little uh you know these little headlines and i, I think in in a lot of instances for our stories people would read the headline and yeah. maybe not do maybe not do any further digging you know what i mean you just kind of hear that totally. you you run with it and i think that that's a big that's a big uh, challenge right now because i think most people that are supplying content they're looking for creative ways to get eyes on what they're selling, which might be entertainment, which yeah. could be news, which could be all yeah. of it, you know? So we kind of have to be, yeah, a, it, it's a real challenge to sort of take the time to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, like, as you were talking there, it got, kind of got me thinking, cause I was, I was, uh, um, talking about two different kinds of fake news, like the fake news created by people who want that fakeness to be true. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and then people who uh, know that they're lying but are doing it maliciously. But then also there's the version that you're talking about where where you know that you're lying, but that's the joke, you know? Um, yeah, right. Like the, the Onion's a good example as well. Right. And, but So now I guess the, the, the next question that, that occurred to me is, like, does, does the work of This Is That and uh, The Onion and, like, some of those other, the Beaverton, um, mm -hmm. another great example, uh, does, like, does the fact that it is comedy but that looks like truth um that like you know sort of at, in a, at its best version is actually helping inoculate us a little from fake news like you know right when, you know it's i i do think that there's kind of this moment where people would always respond to our show who had uh maybe fallen for a story you know they mm -hmm. they hear a, a snippet of something on on cbc radio and and they are outraged and they immediately call in. There's a, a talk back number at the end of our story and people will leave a message, you know, about how furious they are. And then usually what happens is that same person five minutes later will call back and say, oh my gosh, I just realized this is a satirical <laughs> show. Uh, you know, I wasn't listening to, uh, you know, the current, uh, this was a, I understand now this is a joke please disregard my message. And I do think that there's something to be said for how quickly we might recognize within ourselves getting worked up over something almost like on a hair trigger and going, Oh my gosh, I can't even believe this. And then when you have that moment of realization of like, Oh, I was wrong in this, or this was a joke, or this was whatever, that maybe that is, maybe that is something that kind of inoculates us a little bit to being bombarded by this information that maybe it does sort of, remind you you know take a step just take a moment you know engage the critical part of your mind for a second really mm -hmm. try to figure out what information is coming at you um and, yeah. and i think that you know i think that there's there's a lot of gray zone in regards to because i know that you were saying you know for some people it's there's no malicious intent to how they're uh, passing around information it, it may just simply be information that happens to be in your uh, it's it's something that you 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 want to be the case. Exactly. Something that you surround yourself by, uh, like an, uh, as I had mentioned in the talk, almost an echo chamber of our own beliefs. That you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of the internet helps us do that. We start searching a handful of things, and all of a sudden, it, it begins to narrow the information that comes your way. So if you're not kind of actively going out and looking for other perspectives, other point of views, other um, uh, takes on a subject on on anything that what what can begin to happen is that you're only really going to be surrounded kind of by your own voice and yeah. and so it may not be ma malicious it may not be dangerous but it's kind of like 
the internet right now, it, it's, it is set up in that way that it's kind of catering information that really simply fuels your fire, feeds whatever you already believe, you know? So oh, sure. if you yeah. don't sort of go and seek it out, it, the, the trap is that you might be sort of, you just might have a narrow perspective on something as opposed to a broader yeah. view. It doesn't have to change your opinion, but oh, exactly. it's yeah. nice to know that you kind of have sought out uh, a number of different voices on a subject. Oh, completely. Yeah. Uh, um, when you were saying earlier about um, uh, like that, we we can't read everything we we see. Mm-hmm. One thing that remind that reminded me of is I've seen people post uh, articles that then other people have commented on their post and said like, "Did did you read this? Like it, it says these things." And people have been like, "Oh no, I shared it before I read it." Yeah. Yeah. You know. I and can you imagine like handing somebody a book and saying, "Here, I think you should read this." It's like why. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. This may have some content that's important to you. I didn't bother to find out, but it might. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's so true, though. I mean, it does go back to just think about the number of headlines that you see in a day. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether it's, you know, from, from news or whether it's just, you know, uh, an update that someone's sharing about their day, about whatever it is. We have so much uh, information coming at us that it's kind of it's an easy trap to fall into to just kind of uh, look at a headline, share the headline, not really bother to do any digging to figure out what it is, where it's from, whatever. It's just enough to get kind of a trigger of a headline. I mean, it's interesting. Even we, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, it's one thing for a listener to fall for a story that happens to be a comedy story. But what really mm-hmm. sort of surprised us was the number of our satirical stories that were passed around by legitimate news organizations yeah and i mean that that that's what's really quite astonishing and we had even seen in you know it'll be like a a a news anchor or sorry a a news personalities uh Mm -hmm. twitter feed that we'd seen on a couple of occasions who would just simply share a headline of one of our stories kind of with a question mark like in other words it wasn't like even that they had done any research it was like there's a train missing in canada question mark What's happening? You, you know, which is kind of like our even in even in the title itself, we're in the in the sort of one line synopsis. We thought is kind of funny. Like, how does a train go missing? Like, you kind of just follow the tracks. You're gonna find it. It's you know, it didn't, it's not it's not in the middle of like a, a farmer's field. Just follow no. the tracks. So <laughs> it wander you know, off. <laughs> the inherent silliness around just that phrase, but yet that was shared by a really prominent CNN correspondent who's didn't really bother to do any other looking into it, we don't think, but it was just like, what? Train goes missing in Canada. What's happening? You know? Oh, my God. It's interesting. Yeah. So that then, but then somebody, you know, would see that and sort of go, this is a prominent a news personality. Train up has gone missing. Like, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, the headline goes all around the world, but the actual story is whatever people fill it in their own mind. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here, but one thing uh, I just wanted to note too, is that like my first exposure to this is that was getting hoodwinked first. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, you guys did a story where uh, they were going to clean up oil spills in Fort McMurray with a plane. Oh, um, like yes. Scooping oil it up. Planes. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then like you, you had me with that. I was like, that sounds like a dumb idea, but, but just, <laughs> just possible enough yeah. as dumb ideas go. Yeah. And then the next story was, I think, CSIS giving everybody um, uh, trench coats and sunglasses and, and motorcycles. Yeah, it's just kind of like cooling it up a little bit. Maybe look like you're in the <laughs> Matrix or something. You know what I mean? Kind of get our CSIS like, guys and gals kind of looking cool in a leather bomber in her, or trench. Yeah. I, 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 that, was, that was where my critical faculty went, okay, that's, that's odd and funny. Right. And like, Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty um, wild because, you know, we, as I said, that in the beginning of that show, we we really didn't know that that would even be a, a, an element of the show, that people might take what we were saying as real. We just thought it was funny to have some pretty absurd interviews and mockumentary style mm-hmm. um, uh, sort of narratives or whatever, but served up very mm-hmm. dry. And so as, as we began to realize that that was just an, a huge part of it, we kind of we kind of began to think about what, what stories have some sort of part of it that you you go, it's just crazy enough, but it might be true. And, and we, we even sort of had a few things that we sort of thought were 
funny made up stories that ended up turning out to be real. You know what I mean? Like there was, there was yeah. one where we had sort of, where we were messing around with, um, we were messing around with, uh, the idea of how air travels become so uh, crazy. Uh, and as far as you, you're paying a lot, you're not getting much in return. It's getting worse and worse. You know, you're being charged for your this, that, and the other, and you, carry-ons you can't have so we thought well what's kind of the worst extension of of an airline experience we're like what if it was standing room only it's like you, you know and you, you clip into it like you clip into something with a d-ring and you step on the front of the plane and it's just like a city bus where you stuff money in a little receptacle and you've got to pay to use the restroom and there's like a you know a, a soda machine at the front and but anyways you know that was kind of our ridiculous thought of 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 an airline, of a discount airline, mm -hmm. offering that for like 15 bucks and would people do it? And, but lo and behold, you know, people are developed standing room only airlines where you're now standing so you can like pack more people on. And, you know, so it's, it's <laughs> kind of art imitating life or life imitating art or they're yeah. simultaneously well, imitating each other. I, I think there's also that, that the, the fact that like reality can be that dumb and weird sometimes. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. like yeah. <laughs> you can never, like it's it's a uh, it's never impossible that somebody would try something like that. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, now I've got a question here from Linda. Uh, what recommendations do you have on how to teach or explain fake news to kids? Oh man, that's a great question. You know, I think um, as I have a little daughter, she's uh, not really in the uh, news consuming age yet. She's three and a half. <laughs> um, shout out to Opal. Um, but <laughs> you know, I think I think that the most important thing to do on anything is just seek out other perspectives others that agree, some that agree with yours some that don't agree with yours I, I kind of feel like the most important thing is when you see something if it kind of initiates something within you that's either very reactionary or whatever it is i think the most important thing to do is try to find some differing opinions on whatever that subject is and mm. it's a very challenging task for all of us to then take all that information and exercise the critical part of our mind to sort of go, well, what makes the most sense to me? What do I feel speaks to me in that? But I kind of think it's seeking out alternative viewpoints to your own uh, mm, is, is yes. really important because it, it kind of keeps you reminded that, you know, the world as you see it, it may not always be true simply through your eyes, that it's like to broaden our own perspectives into a number of uh, a number of other viewpoints is imperative. And in doing that, maybe you will get closer to figuring out a truth that a truth that makes some sense to yourself. I mean, there is some gray zone. I mean, not with all things. There's some things that's there's fact and there's fiction. But in some in some other um, contexts, trying to figure out what makes sense for you, the most important thing is seeking out other viewpoints. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, and uh, so Teal here has a note, um, and I think it's kind of connected to what we were saying there, but um, uh, some just like to have ridiculous, controversial things to argue about, especially on social media. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, <laughs> you know, the idea of a flame war, you know, just the uh, idea of having something to get worked up over uh, mm -hmm. is, is really true. I, I, I think that's kind of... It becomes obviously online. It becomes this place that you can hide behind a pseudonym or whatever you want, just for the mm -hmm. idea of getting, of being able to get out and engage with somebody else in kind of a vitriolic way, right? Uh, yeah. I think that's absolutely. Well, I think that's absolutely part of it. And that was in your video too, because uh, um, you mentioned how, like, sometimes you'd get people phoning you about both sides of the story. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And we. I mean, it was. We, we, we had a number of examples of this because obviously we're creating controversies that don't exist. And we always thought that we had done maybe the best job uh, on a story uh, as a satirical piece when you would have people vehemently arguing both sides of an argument that doesn't exist to begin with, you know, like one that exactly. it was mentioned in the talk, but that, uh, that I remember was just a, a, a ridiculous notion that somebody had made the complaint that the maple leaf uh, on the Canadian flag too closely resembled a marijuana leaf and that, you know, and that this needed to change the government, you know, the, uh, the government needed to um, intervene so that it doesn't try to promote that Canada has lax laws on uh, drugs and regulations. And so obviously it's, first of all, 
it is a pretty crazy notion that there, I mean, actually it's probably not, I'm sure somebody's actually had that thought, but, um, but, um, but obviously an argument that doesn't exist and to have, it became a talking point for people to have perspectives on both sides of it. Like I've thought this for years and it's a red liberal leaning agenda. And <laughs> you know, other people saying like, it's about time. Canada's progressive. We, you know, I, I would love it. We should change it to that. Like, you know, it, it, it's, it is kind of funny that you find these uh, ridiculous, uh, funny, non-existent arguments or thoughts and to have people jump in on both sides of it is really, it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's its kind of, I, I sort of feel like that's where we've done, or that's where we know that we've, we've struck a good chord is when you have people fighting for both sides of something that's not real. Well, and it, it, it makes me wonder too, like um, there's, a, there's actually a really good graphic novel called The Nightly News. Um, have you, have you read that? No, no. Okay. Um, uh, highly recommend it. It's, uh, uh, and part of what it does is it's, it's a fictional story, but through the process kind of provides a lot of statistics about newsmaking and, and a lot of what you discovered as well, like about the, not just the way the news is reported, but the packaging of it. Right. Um, uh, but what it makes me kind of think of too, is that like, uh, what did you call it? The, the double header where you hear two oh, sides yeah, of Oh yeah, double ender. Double, Double ender, ender yeah. or a freight train or uh, what else yeah. did we have in there? Yeah, it, it was funny because when we when we realized that what we were trying to do is kind of closely resemble the sound of public radio for, you know, for um, obviously for our audience, it's CBC, like in, in Canada, mm -hmm. public radio, the, our national broadcaster. And, and so we thought, well, if we're trying to kind of resemble that tone that is so recognizable, I mean, all Canadians know the sound of the CBC. We grew up with it. It's in the car. It's in your house. It's, it has a distinct, like a, a tone that you know when you've landed on Radio 1. It doesn't sound like Kiss FM or anything like that. You know when you've landed <laughs> on it. It has its own tone. And, yeah. and so we sort of thought, well, if we're going to use that as the backdrop for us to do characters and comedy and the rest of it, we should try to figure out, are there any tricks of the trade that are very identifiable and iconic to how uh, information is presented on CBC? So we, you know, we spoke to a, a senior producer on a, um, for one of CBC's um, regional news programs. And she just walked us through a couple of formats that, they present their news in and it's mostly you know it's kind of over time you you get down to this shorthanded way of how are you going to package your information i mean i know that when we're when we're working on our, our radio show or a comedy show we begin to slowly um get into a, a pattern and a rhythm where we're trying to for workflow reasons have ways in which we can edit and piece piece together information piece together comedy piece together whatever you want so that it's a little bit easier in producing a show so mm -hmm. uh same thing would happen in for a news program. So they would have these uh, formats that they could simply plug a story into, one of which being a double ender, one of which being a, called a freight train, one of which is called, um, it, it'll, it'll come back to me and say, oh, a talk tape is another one. Right. So it, it's basically, it's basically um, formats. And so what happens is that once we hear a format, I think we kind of subconsciously already begin to associate that with like a, in this case, with a truthful news story, because it's like, oh, I recognize the format that this story is being told to me in as news, so it's news, uh, yeah, you know, cool. and it's it's interesting, <laughs> understandably so. I mean, it, you know, there's, it's it's funny when when we learn that those kind of uh, tricks of packaging stories, and as soon as we listen to them ourselves, we're like, oh my gosh, these are so iconic. I've never broken it down in my own mind when listening to it, but it's like once you once you do it, once you a service story up in that way, you sort of go, Oh yeah, I, this is, I've listened to a thousand of these. Yeah. Not really been aware, you know, and it, in terms of their production of it, it makes me wonder too, like, not the, like, uh, um, now you were manufacturing controversies, manufacturing right. stories. Yeah. Um, I'm not, not to imply that, that the media is manufacturing stories, but if they are sort of, uh, judging an argument a little right. to, you know what I mean? Like, so that in the, in the sense of say like a, a double header, uh -huh. a subject that doesn't necessarily need two opinions. Yes. Is getting yeah. you know, a, a sort of a false debate in a way. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it becomes a shorthand for how you can present something. And I think that you're right. You know, I think that first of all, I mean, 
having having two perspectives it's the double ender if you will is basically having two people speak on a subject so the host is like you know uh you introduce what the subject is then you go uh for uh, so-and-so's thoughts on it we join so-and-so in wherever we listen to them for 30 seconds and then it's like now for a counterpoint perspective we go to this person and it's it's there's variations on that that i'm sure everybody recognizes and has, and has heard but i think that you're right some things don't necessarily require uh having um a, a controversial discussion about but maybe maybe in some instances people might choose to present what could be a dull news story and juice it up a little <laughs> bit by saying we need to get two perspectives on this because it's a hot button issue you know <laughs> yeah it's a bit like they, they've they've uh, increased the heat of the button on their own yeah exactly <laughs> exactly turn the temperature up a little bit Exactly. Yeah. Well, we did um, that in a story where it was like a, an argument that was happening over which town in Canada was the prettiest. And we basically just got into an all out war between two towns. Like it was one, I think Kimberly, BC <laughs> might have been one and then somewhere in southern Ontario. And it was just like, you know, this all out war <laughs> over who's the prettiest town. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's a that's a movie right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I liked something that you said there earlier about like uh, echo chambers and like, and I think something there too, is that like, even I think more so than when, when we aired the, the, uh, when we had, when we had you on TEDx YYC, I think even more so now information really does seek us out. So like I was saying, yeah. your headline, like your echo chamber and the algorithms that are going, okay, they usually click on these things. So we're going to give yeah. them more of that. Um, yeah. uh, one thing that I also noticed, so I rewatched the video yesterday and made some notes. Yeah. Um, uh, and I read the comments and there was somebody in the comments who stated, did anyone else have to watch for five minutes to see if it was a gag? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Which for me, A, it still works. Like, yeah. And you even point this out in the video. You're like, look, I'm on the TEDx stage. I'm on the dot. Like, you're going to believe me. Yeah. But also that it's always someone's first time for the joke. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, you know, um, even even in sort of the crafting of the talk, you know, I worked with Cam uh, in Calgary leading up to the, uh, you know, leading up to the um, to the actual talk. And one of the things that she had mentioned and, and was really kind of excited about and, and in, in sort of chatting with a few of the folks who are obviously putting together the uh, that year's Ted X talk was the notion that, you know, could it mirror how the show, this is that works where it starts out, um, not letting the cat out of the bag that this is necessarily going to be, um, a, a joke kind of story that I'm telling. So talking about the, mm -hmm. in this, in this particular instance, it was the, uh, aquarium story, uh, in Calgary, but trying to, trying to serve it up as it originally was, as though it was a legitimate news story. And I think I addressed myself as, you know, I've been working for the CBC for years and have covered many stories. Probably the most controversial story that I covered was this. And in, in framing it that way, it's not a lie. It was a story and I was covering it, but I'm not a journalist and it's not a true story. So, it's, you know, but it was that idea of maybe starting out with that as the launching pad to see how far down the road you could go and at what point different people clued in that this is not a journalist talking about a truthful story, but this is somebody who is you know, recounting their ridiculous comedic story that they served up as a true story. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, anybody that hasn't watched that video or or uh, is willing to watch it again, go back and look at the moments that the camera looks at the audience, because as you're telling that story, there is there is kind of a moment where you see them get it, where you see them like where you see this, this switch flip and they're like, oh, this isn't true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of I mean, it is. It's, it's a very interesting thing to kind of go from that transition within yourself of mm. believing something about whatever it is that you are uh, watching or taking in or reading or uh, consuming in whatever way and having a fundamental change in your perspective on what it is that you're actually watching. You know, it's kind of like you go in to see something that you think is going to be a comedy film and you realize, whoa, wait a minute. I thought this was a comedy film. This is not, uh, or you know, but it's it's that idea of like that transition, that argument within yourself, or the the conflict within yourself. 
about trying to make a determination and then actually, more importantly, changing that determination midstream, you know, sort of going, oh, I don't think I was right um, in what I thought here. Yeah, yeah, the changing that determination. And I think what you just said there too about, oh, hey, I wasn't right. That's a huge thing for people to be able to do is to go, hold on a second, what I just believed isn't true. Yeah. You know, and so maybe that's a, it's a good like exercise to like constantly be testing yourself that way. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, uh, uh, so I'm just, uh, I'm trying to see if there's any new questions here, but one thing that I wanted to also throw at you was, um, I, I, th I thought a lot as well about some of the other, um, oh, and anybody, anybody in our live chat here that didn't hear the beginning, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat and then I will ask them to Peter. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So there are a lot of, um, uh, like there's now a genre of comedy news, you know? Yeah. Um, like the Beaverton and uh, the Daily Show, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, what distinguishes this is that is that it is that it does it never really like played its hand, if that makes sense. Yes, um, it stayed like it sort of stayed uh, uh, straight, straight faced. Right. Um, uh, since you've since the talk and since this is that, have you felt like have you have you ever? wished that you still had that platform to engage with a particular subject or controversy? Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I kind of, we always sort of feel like the format of that show or the, the tact and the nature of that show for us is one that it, it always, we always sort of go, oh, this would have been a great story or this would be something that would be pretty fun, you know. But it's interesting, in the, in the 10 years that we had done that show, you know, when the notion of, a joke story being sent out to be nothing more than a joke and, and to have some people believe it was kind of innocent and, and good natured and fun. And by the end of, you know, by the last uh, couple of years and the rise and the sort of the hot button nature of, of fake news, it, it became something that even for ourselves, we we're like, it's just not really like a laughing matter. Like even though it wasn't like our intention, we yeah. began to even shift our content where we were like, our show isn't really trying to fool people. We want to be even a bit broader and make sure that this is a comedy show for people because that's our intention. Um, mm -hmm. But the notion, the climate, the world um, of fake news really changed how the place that we felt that that show held. Do you know what I mean? So we kind yeah. of originally what seemed to be pretty, pretty fun as, as, as we move ahead and we're sort of seeing some of what was happening in, in, uh, you know, the war on truth, we were kind mm -hmm. of like, yeah, it's not, it's not kind of that innocent, silly fun. We have to be very, very mindful that we're serving up a comedy show. We're not trying to, you know, mess around with mm -hmm. people. Although we do think that satire has a huge place and we do appreciate the notion that it engages a critical part of your mind. I think those are huge things. But we were very yeah. cognizant of like the landscape has changed in ten years from when we started the show to where it is now. Yeah, it, like there's a there's a responsibility in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and for us, because it's our intention at the very beginning was simply to make a comedy show. Like, but we just mm -hmm. like comedy served up in that way. Yeah. And so you know, we we would just kind of be reminded of like that's the takeaway that we want for people listening. We want people to mm -hmm. realize for those that sort of do sit forward and clue in when they when the penny drops that this is a satirical piece and that this is you know this is uh, the driving force behind this is comedic that when mm -hmm. that when that penny drops for us that's what it's about it's it's about the joy that the joy that somebody has at falling for something and then calling back to say oh my gosh okay never mind my comment from earlier i realized this is a joke this is hilarious and actually that then builds this community of listeners who part of the fun for uh, our audience was to not let the cat out of the bag, to let those be initiated into the club as they, you know, as, as they made that, uh, as they sort of figured it out on their own, as they had their first, this is that story that they fell for, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we, we really carefully didn't want to uh, wink and, and say that this is a comedy show. Although in our minds, we would always sort of say this show is littered with things that, seemed pretty obvious that this could not be possibly real but yeah. um but you know in in that show itself and in that 
listening to something on the radio, you hear a soundbite of something, you hear a piece of something on the internet, you see a headline. It's very easy, very quickly, without kind of doing much further digging to kind of get going in the uh, take something for what it's not, you know? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, Teal here uh, has a note about uh, the truthful format kind of shifts. And, and I think maybe even has shifted even since when you, when you were first doing the show. Yeah. Um, some people, it's some people's instinct to be incredibly ultra critical of, of an official news story, but then they'll believe something they see on YouTube, on Reddit, on forums. Right. Um, like, in fact, just the, the whole notion, like that you'll see people criticize something because it was on mainstream yes. media. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Certainly. Um, Certainly. I mean, you can, you can sort of look at the, I mean, I, I think that that's absolutely, that's absolutely true is that I, I think that you have to be, you have to hold everybody to account. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not like some of the stories that we were uh, of our stories that were picked up and pursued or shared by large news organizations were completely uh, <laughs> false. But I mean, these are big, these are big companies. I mean, it's like Fox news was one. Uh, I mean, uh, Harper's, uh, was one, I mean, like, you know, uh, the Washington Post, I mean, these are large, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to be, you know, you need to be mindful of, of keeping, you know, holding everyone into account. Uh, but I, yeah. I suppose that that's, that's the case. It's just that I think sometimes what happens is you can simply go out, you can find support for any harebrained thought you have in any direction. You can find support for that on the internet. Mm -hmm. You want to have uh, you know, uh, an argument with someone I can find on whatever the subject is. In fact, I'm sure if I went looking for like, uh, you know, that the maple leaf on the Canadian flag looks like a pot leaf. I'm sure I could do enough digging to find a lot of different people who would verbalize something similar. And, yes. you know, so it's kind of like we have to be careful because you can find anything you want to support, whatever your belief is. But you just have to remind yourself about what is it that I'm really looking for? Um, yeah. You know? Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's well. And, and that's like, what am I looking for? And also like, am I being critical about it? Yeah. 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 Um, so we're, we're getting into about 45 minutes here. Um, is there, uh, maybe actually I have one more question before yeah. we, before we wrap anything up. Uh, did you watch the video again? Uh, no, I didn't, but okay. you know, but you know, what's so interesting, uh, is that I went back to look at the beginnings of, uh, of what I had written. At the talking okay. points, I didn't watch it, but I, I, I don't know. I just, I just went back and I, I was kind of curious as to what the original, like where I originally came at um, the talk, what, you know, where I sort of my original thinkings about what I wanted to bring into the talk. And so I kind of, yeah. I kind of, I went over those and I just went over some of my original, uh, you know, thoughts about it, but you know, as I say, I'm 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 a comedian. I'm 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 not a journalist. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I wouldn't say <laughs> I'm a, a uh, you know a a particular. I, I, I might not consider myself. Uh, let's just say I was surprised that I was invited to do a TEDx talk. But <laughs> you know, I, I'm not I'm not a scholar. But um, <laughs> but I do think that it's it's very interesting the perspective that we slowly began began to have about fake news because of how we uh, were introduced to it in our, in, in what we were doing. And, yeah. and in doing so, I, 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 I have to say that we were, we were and have always been very surprised at just how easy it would be for something to take off. That was just so fake. Yeah. And yeah. when something really kind of caught fire, um, it, it was kind of alarming. I mean, you know, we would sort of, and in fact, we would even have that discussion about like, Oh my gosh, did you see that story? It's like, it's taking off like all over the place. And there's that part of you that's like, it's almost in a dreading way where you're sort of going like, Oh my gosh, it's like, it's all over the place that people think that a, a, a ball was removed from youth soccer to, so that yeah. there's no, uh, you know, to, to, to take away the negative effects of competition. And, and it would just start this online flame war. So almost like in a, in, a, in a strangely dreadful way where you sort of go, how could something that was meant to be basically so clearly a, a ridiculous joke piece be taken so seriously and go so far so fast? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, one thing you just mentioned uh, um, was that you were surprised to be asked to do a TED Talk. Yeah. Um, 
So now that you now that you can add like TEDx speaker to your to your resume, look out! I know. I mean, it was on well, my it was on my resume well before I did the talk. It just, <laughs> you know, it just looks great. Um, but to then be able to actually claim that it was true, <laughs> that feels right. Like. Oh man, it's like an achievement. There we go, yes. like achievement unlocked in a video yes. game. Um, but uh, uh, has that? Um, has there been any kind of further further feeling or or use that you have found as like having been a, a, a TEDx speaker? Like, has that has that come up in any way, or you know, have you like leveled it or you know I, engaged with that in any way? I think the biggest thing for me about it is actually taking time to put words around a subject that you might know something about. Like, and it, it sounds very simple and very very. Um, a very simple thought. And look, it probably is. I'm not a scholar, but uh, it, it really is to be able to actually articulate and put words around an experience that you had became very illuminating for me. Uh, mm. You know, that uh, talking about something that I, I, I had sort of maybe intuitively known a little bit because of my experience doing, spending some time to put words and to, to put words around it and to deconstruct it and to break down the components and pieces and elements of that story or that experience and, and, you know, putting it in a methodical thought through way of presenting something is really something that, uh, it, it it's just an amazing task for somebody to do about anything. It, mm. it, it told me, I learned so I was in trying to find words to describe this really illuminated it for me as well a lot what exactly was at play and and why would somebody believe one of our stories is true when it seems so false and Mm -hmm. why is you know the cbc now asking us to put the banner of satire on what we're doing and and that was something that happened towards the end of towards the end of our time uh of, of having the show broadcast is yeah, that the landscape had changed, but also then trying to sort of go, trying to put into words uh, what this whole experience set against uh, the backdrop of fake news. What, how, what does that all mean? What does it all look like? And that, that mm-hmm. was something that really, uh, was really, uh, it was a really cool experience to be sort of guided and shepherded through how to do that. Cool. Cool. Um, uh, I, I feel like I would just have one more question. Um, but uh, uh, the was it always the plan to start the talk with uh, like sort of a straight story that then turned comedy, or uh, like what was yeah? Maybe if you could talk a bit about that development. No, you know. So um, you know, for those who have not worked in, on a, a TEDx talk in that way, it was all new to me. Where you know, uh, I was partnered up um, with Cam, who was. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Like, what what would the title be? Basically, basically, somebody who is like your a mentor, really, like to yeah, kind of help a sounding board, a mentor, somebody to uh, kind of help uh, have the conversation about what your talk is going to be about. And so, it came very early on uh, that you know, uh, amongst the mentors, the idea was put forth. Wouldn't it be fun if it started out like if we could have the audience for a time, believe this fake story so that they could experience what it is like to, you know, fall for something that's fake, but then make the discovery at some point that this is a a fake piece of information. And so that came early on, but it was not, it was not my, that wasn't my original thought on it. It was like, it was, it, because for me, I was kind of like, I don't want to trick the audience. Like, I, I don't want to do that. They're going to hate me. You know, it's like, I, I don't want them to, you know, I don't want them to, I don't want to uh, catch the fury that of them and the crowd two minutes in going, that was a lie. You lied. <laughs> you know, but, um, but I think it was a very effective way of a really cool way of trying to uh, give someone the experience of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was really interesting. I, I don't know what my original a thought was for how the the shape or might be or what the talk would be, <laughs> but but that that very quickly became a tack that we took on it that was really, I think in the end, really an effective way of framing it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, I think it was it was absolutely perfect. Um, you know, it just 
being, I remember being in the house watching, uh, watching the show and obviously knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and watching the audience, like watching them, watching yeah. the penny drop live. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 It was really, it was really, and I mean, obviously, I mean, that's my hometown and, and, uh, love Calgary, man. And to, um, mm-hmm. And I would say, but it was also pretty fun to to have the story that we chose to do this on be one that was in our show set in Calgary. It's kind of fun too, you know. I mean, yeah, it was perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely perfect. Yeah, and the feedback too. Um, yeah, the, the, everyone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and you even mentioned that too about bias. That like people have a certain bias about Calgary and have sure. bias about Alberta, and so sure, you and know, so that, it's. I think it's that's that's true of of every place of of anything. We have biases mm-hmm. that. Yeah, they may not actually be particularly harmful, this, that, or the other. It's always, there's something in there. But, like, you know, I, I think people think of an Albertan as slightly different than they think of, you know, someone from, uh, I don't know, Newfoundland. Or, you know, I mean, it's, it's it, and exactly. may or may not be true, but we all have sort of thoughts about what it's like to be someone that's living on Vancouver Island as opposed to, you know, wherever else. I mean, we have these these kind of, uh, mm-hmm. relatively playful, I would say in Canada, we have these ideas and notions of, of, of what that, what that is. And so it wasn't by accident that we chose to put that story in Calgary because it's a bit more, I don't know, it plays into some biases that already exist. that Albertans are, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's kind of the wild west, baby. We do our yeah. own thing, you know it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, I, I think I, I said it before, but I think I'll just say it again is that there's like reality can be just as crazy anyway correct and so like and i think that that that's actually kind of why it catches people is because it's always like we've we've all experienced at least one thing at least that crazy in real life yeah yeah <laughs> and 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 significantly crazier <laughs> you yeah. know yeah Ooh. yeah so it's true um so yeah I've, I've had a great time chatting with you um Jason, me too man thank you so much it's yeah. such a treat to uh revisit that talk you know and and yeah, really, I, I would say it, it's been very interesting that uh, to touch back again, you said after after that talk, it, it I really clocked the number of people that would come up to me after a, a live show that we would do of This Is That and mm-hmm. and really be wanting to engage about the nature of our content and having mm-hmm. sort of spent that time kind of investigating, putting words to what that um, is was really uh, something great to be able to then have some some pretty cool conversations post comedy show with people who are curious about you know the connection between our comedy show and and fake news and and the sort of the landscape of truth in the modern world you know so yeah yeah cool well yeah and we were we were really happy to have you that was a it was a great talk and a great time, and this has been a great time. And uh, Absolutely, my yeah. pleasure. So now I just really? need to make another comedy show about a different subject that I could then somehow sound, like, you know, scholarly about down the road. So I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a comedy show about medicine. And then you'll have me back on about, the you know, the, the perils of, uh, of modern medicine. There we go. Or the perils of comedy diagnoses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Laughter is oh the God. best medicine, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> I want this. I want this TED Talk. Yes, listen, let's do it. I'm pitching the CBC tomorrow. <laughs> there That's we go. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, I'm going to let you go, but we'll uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Jason, thanks, man. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, thanks to those folks that um, uh, you know have been on the feed and, and for watching the talk, and it's been a total pleasure. Big love to Calgary. Woo!